שלום עליכם, דירסט פרנס. שלום עליכם פרם ארץ הקודש. שלום עליכם to all of you, wherever you are. We're so thankful you're with us. We have a very, very special few minutes to be together, a program that I want to share with you just בקיצר, בקיצר, what this is all about tonight. But as you can see in front of you, tonight, learning, experience, tefillah, tonight's nigun is dedicated in loving memory of Reb Mordechai Arya Yosef, Ben Chai Moshe, Zechat Zalik Levracha, This is, of course, our Rebbe's father, Rav Weinberger's Abba, sponsored by numerous loving friends and Talmidim. Basically, in a nutshell, early this morning, well, for you in America, at approximately 4.30 in the morning, we did a program here in Eretz Yisrael where we went into the lives, we delved just briefly into the lives of a number of amazing, amazing Gevalda Gitzadikim that Pashut aren't known, that their stories aren't really known, their Torahs, their visions, their dreams, their families, the whole Indian, simply not so much known. And for a while now, we did some research into, into seeking them out, seeking out their story, getting pictures of them. And like we're going to be doing now, we spent a few minutes on each of the tzaddikim and while looking into their eyes and hearing their story briefly. The chiyas was tremendous. And for hours after the program this morning in Eretz Yisrael, I was receiving emails, messages of all sorts with additional pictures that people had from family connections. Someone called me actually and realized that him and I are cousins based on something that I said. And one of our lines, people are realizing that they are relatives A, a tremendous amount of chiburim, of connections, were taking place. For most of us, the connections that we feel to so many of these names, aside from some of us coming from homes with these kind of yichas, has been the years and years of hearing story after story, teaching after teaching, from our dear Rebbe, Rav Weinberger, who's with us right now. And we're so privileged and honored to do this tonight in memory of Rebbe's Ava, and to hear right now from Rebbe. Okay, are you able to hear me? It's okay? Yeah? Good. I, I, don't, I don't know how to thank the Hever from Shira David from the Shul and Yedid Nafshi, Libi, Libi Venafshi. Rav Shlomo, I don't know how to thank you. This came as a total surprise to me, to my family, that my father, Harmeni Kaparis Mishkova, that my father would be honored in such a way. Rav Shlomo is going to be talking about Rebbe's that we haven't heard much about. There was a Rebbe that I grew up with all of my life until this past Tu B'Shvat, who I heard very little from. He spoke very little. And he wasn't officially a Rebbe. He would have probably gotten smicha had the Germans not arrived. But I listened to him, and I'm still listening to him. He might be somebody that others haven't heard of, maybe through some of my teachings, a few people have heard of him. This week is the week of Gevur, of strength, of courage. And we've passed through these days of Ferris, of Gevur. I spoke the other day to the, to the Chavra, Ferris, the beauty of of our heroes, of Gvura, of Giborm, of Jewish heroes, of heroic Jews. Here in America, we're holding still by Hoyt, the Teferis, and Netzach, Netzach, the victory. For me to be able to say to my father, 
the daddy, you have won. The hide the glory of that victory of a quiet, humble Jew. So I want to share with you one story, and then Rav Shlomo is going to take over the rest of the night. I want to share with you just one story. I asked Shlomo if it was okay to tell this story. He knows this. And many of the Chavim know this because I was saying it over during Shiva. When my father was alive, I was nervous that he would hear that I was saying this. But now I believe it's a mitzvah to repeat. And it's about the Teferis, the Netzach, the Hod of Gevur. It's about a Rebbe that you've never heard of. Mordechai Ari Yosef and Chaim Ayesha. Growing up in a house of survivors, my father was in Mauthausen, my mother, she should live long, healthy years, was in Auschwitz. Growing up in that world, at a relatively early age, I, I was already tormented by their nightmares that I would hear sometimes, the screaming. And by what I was reading about, and my father began to tell me some stories. And he never thought that in any way my amuna, my faith, would be shaken by what I was hearing. Not strengthened, but shaken. And I had many questions. Once I actually asked my father, and he had a sad look in his eyes, and he didn't answer me. I was very young. And then the day came for me to put on my tefillin. As is the custom, a month before, I have a mitzvah to put on film. And my father told me that he wants me to put on his film, not my own. And I was very disappointed. I had these brand new, beautiful film from a famous self from Williamsburg. I was all excited. And I said, but daddy, you know, I have my own film you bought me. My father said, no, you just put on my film. And he said, but, but I'm a lefty, daddy, and you're a righty. My father said, don't worry about it. You're not by mitzvah, just put on the film. And I saw that he was very determined, and I put on the film. And he said, say Krishna, and I said, Krishna. And he said, now I want to talk to you about what you asked me in the past. I want to talk to you now about really what it means to be Jew and how to survive. How I survived and how you're going to survive. You know, I was growing up in Queens, survival meant doing well on the basketball court and school. My father said, I'm going to tell you how to survive. So he said that the young men in my city, in my town, Ungvar, the young men were being taken away. The parents, the grandparents, the little ones were kept in the ghetto. They were, of course, taken to Auschwitz where my grandparents, everybody was all killed. They were all killed. And the young men were being taken away. My grandfather, who I'm named after, who I never met, Chaim Moshe, my grandfather went with my father to the train station. The young men were being taken by the Hungarians at that time who were vicious, being taken by the Hungarians to forced labor. Some ended up staying in that. Others, like my father, went on graduated and went to concentration camp. So my father was with my grandfather at the train station. And my grandfather said to my father, we're not going to see each other again. That's the end. And my father began to cry. So what are you talking about? Here the Americans are coming. The Russians are not far away. My grandfather said, no, we're not going to see each other again in this world. But in the next world, the sooner in Svansik, when you're 120, we'll see each other. But you, but you have to put it on your film every day. No matter what, whatever's going to come upon you, this next period of your life. My, my grandfather said, if you put on your film, you'll survive. Don't miss a day. And my father said goodbye. It was the last time he saw my grandfather. He ended up eventually in Matthaus and he never missed a day of film. And we don't know how. I was going to bring the film here to show you, and I forgot to pick them up before. We don't know how. My father was able to put on the film every day, and not only did he put on the film, but hundreds, if not thousands, of Jews risked their lives to put on that film because they would 
borrow from my father, put on for second and you get caught, you get killed. And there was a miracle that happened with this film. I mean, the whole existence of the film in Matazan was a miracle, and some people have researched it, and people have tried to buy those films. One night I came in or screaming and yelling for all the Jews to get out of the barracks, out of this bunk that they were in. And they came with dogs and they were hitting them and my father didn't know what to do with this film. They, were t they came with, with tremendous blow torches to burn down the barracks because they were, they were infested with lice. My father said the lice were like, like this big and the place was infested and the Germans were afraid that they would catch the virus. So the Jews had to all leave and they started to burn the place down. And my father didn't know what to do. And they said, they were screaming at them to get undressed. And my father got undressed. He, he didn't care about anything, just this film. You can't get caught with them. He didn't know where to put them there. And he wrapped them up in, his, in, in the shmata, in the pajamas that they had. And they were yelling at them to go outside and to throw their things on the floor. And they had a tractor and they were pushing everything into a big fire. They were burning all of their clothing and they were taking them away. My father didn't know if he was going to come back from where they were taking them. Actually, they were taking them to disinfect them. My father didn't know, but he knew that at this point, he lost hope because everything was being taken into the fire, including his film. My father went and he said that they brought them back and he looked at that spot when they were passing by and everything was gone. Everything was taken except for the film. Even though he wrapped them inside the shmata, the film were there. So my father said, you asked me about Hashem during those years. You once asked me, I'm telling you, I don't have an answer. But I know that Hashem didn't leave me in that place by myself. Many of us feel now very lonely. We're alone. We have to be alone. We're never, ever, ever alone. And from that moment on, my father told me that I've never, ever felt alone. Ever. My father said, you put on film every day and you'll never, ever be alone. I'm always with you, mommy. We should be with you. But even Khalil, if we're not, you're never alone. Just put on your film every day. So listen, Hever, Rav Shlomo is now going to take over. You're going to learn amazing things about amazing tzaddik and giborim, teferis, hod, netzach, hod, giborim, heroes of the Jewish people that you've never heard of. But I want to tell you something. You have yourself, besides the Rebbeim, wonderful Rabbanim that you all know, you have Rebbeis in your own lives that you've never heard of, like your wife, your husband, your parents. You've heard of them, but you've never heard that they are rabbis. Pay close attention during this time in particular, and you're going to find out that you're living in the same house just as I grew up all the years, in the house of Atzadi Gisad Olam, that I took for granted. So let's not take the living Tzadikim for granted, and let us never ever forget the memory of the Tzadikim that we've heard of and the Tzadikim that you're now going to hear about from my beloved friend, Rav Shlomo. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. What a source this is <clears throat> to do this, Lilui Nishmas, your Rabbi, who's really our Rabbi as well. Many of these names that the Hebra are going to be learning tonight, like I mentioned before, these are names that, that we've been drinking from your Be'er for so many years. We just want to bless Rabbi and the Mishpacha with Arichus Yamim good health and only simchas. And Be'ez Hashem, like Rabbi always says, we're going to be dancing in Yerushalayim, Yer Kodesh. Like Chaim David says, Kvar Achshav. Already now, Be'ez Hashem. So I didn't know where to, where to begin, but I'm actually going to add on from certain tzaddikim we did not do this morning. Some of the pictures you're going to see are pictures that you're familiar with. All I ask, Bemet, is one thing, whoever's with us, to please look at the eyes of the tzaddik while we're talking about him. That's it. Just to look at the eyes of the tzaddik while we're talking about him. Some of the tzaddikim you have heard of, but their stories are unknown. 
For instance, the first tzaddik we're going to be learning from, learning about, and hearing his story will show up right now in your screen. And that is, of course, the Heilige, Heilige Alexander Rebbe. And look at the words that the Alexander said. It's Rabbi Yitzchak Menachem Mendel of Alexander. Mekimi me'ofer adal me'ashpres yam re'im evyan, we say. He says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu me'irim ha'ratzon tov shel Yisrael, afilu kshuhu b'vchinas evyan ha'ta'ev l'chol davar. Even when you and I have a little, uh, we have a taiva, a ratzon, what we want from life is so shmach, the Rebbe Shleim lifts, lifts that ratzon up to somewhere so much more kedai, so much more special. Herim ha'ratzon tov, she'akoyach ha'gdusha she'bo yizgabe. He lifts up our ratzon tov, that the koyach of holiness within us will be what nizgabe becomes stronger. Why? Lo yishivi im nedivi im nedivi amoy. Kaddish lifts up the good Ratzon with Nedivim, Nedive Amo. Who are the Nedivim? Who are these people? Who are these big people? Heim ha'avos hakadoshim. Now look at these words, Chavra. Sheisnavdvu es atzmam lehishachet al kedushas shmo yisbarach. These are the tzaddikim. These are our avos hakadoshim who were menadev, they, they, they gave of themselves to be shechted al Kiddush Hashem. When the Rebbe Hashem lifts up our Ratzon, where does he take us to? It seems here that Alexander is saying he takes us to the place. He takes us to the place of what's called being shechted al Kiddush Hashem. And you're going to hear those words many times in the next little while, being shechted al Kiddush Hashem. The eyes, the eyes, the eyes, the eyes of this tzaddik, Rabbi Yitzchak Menachem Mendel Danziger of Alexander, who, who, who is he? So you all know, just in a nutshell, we're going to go through the dynasty. The first in this dynasty was a Rabbi Shraga Feivel of Gritza. And Reb Shraga Feivel of Gritzel was a Talmud of Reb Simcha Bonim of Pshischa and Reb Itzel of Orker. And this Reb Shraga Feivel has a son, Reb Yechiel Danziger. And this Reb Yechiel Danziger has a son that many of you have heard of, Reb Yachmiel Yisrael Yitzchak of Alexander. He's known for his famous sefer, the Yismach Yisrael. And the Yismach Yisrael didn't have any children. So when he was Nifter, who became Rebbe? His brother the Tiferes Shmuel. And the Tiferes Shmuel's son is the tzaddik that you're looking at right now. Rabbi Yitzchak Menachem Mendel Danziger. And he was a Rebbe for 18 years in Alexander. He had a yeshiva in Alexander, he had a yeshiva in Lodz. The yeshiva in Alexander, he called it Beis Yisrael. And he had hundreds, hundreds of chassidim would come to Alexander for Shabbos and Yantav. I once heard a number about how many chassidim, how many Alexander chassidim there were before the Germans came in yeah, I think it was something like 250,000. What's Alexander today? What's Alexander today? Now, the Rebbe that you're looking at had 10 children. And during World War II, he went to Warsaw with his full family. And like many of the tzaddikim at the time, he also received a permit to get to Eretz Yisrael, but obviously he would not leave his chassidim. There's a lot more to say, but because I want to go through a few of them, there's an important thing I want to point out over here, because we're going to see this coming in and out a number of times. Everyone knows the famous factory. The famous factory in the Warsaw Ghetto, the Schultz factory. Why do we know of the Schultz factory that you're seeing in front of you? Because obviously we all know that that is the factory where the Rebbe, where the Piasetzna Hashem also was working in the shoe factory. Other tzaddikim also were working there. Other tzaddikim we're going to be hearing from tonight, like the Moshe Betzal Alter, who was the brother of the Imre Emes, and the Sosna Chiver, he was there too. Other tzaddikim, like we said, the Piasetzna. And this tzaddik, our tzaddik, Rebbe Menachem Mendel, 
he was a, he was a sandlar in this factory. And I saw an amazing story that happened between him and the Pia Setzner. He saw that the Pia Setzner, one day was mopping the floors and he saw that the Rebbe, that the Helega Eshkoidish was tired. He was getting tired. And he asked him, he said, he said to him, I would, I would love, I had the exact Lushan. He said, I saw the Rebbe so tired. Maybe I can take the matate, I could take the mop and I can clean instead of you. I, I want to mishamish the Rebbe just like my grandfather, my great grandfather was Meshamish, his Rebbe, Rebbe it's a Levorker. And the Piazetzna looked at me and said to me, Your grandfather and your father were Meshamish Rebbe's, and you want to Meshamish a Sandlar Pashut? Now, one Friday night, Elul 1942, the Germans barged in there. They kidnapped the Rebbe that you're looking at. And they brought him to the town square in the center of the town. And they put him on a train. And the Rebbe was sent to Treblinka, where he was killed. To tell you, Chavra, a few years ago, his picture showed up on some webpage. And I wasn't sure who it was then. I put it on my desktop. And every time I wanted to zetz myself with little Elul, whether it was Shvat or... ER or, or, or Elo. I just looked, I looked into these eyes, I looked into this face. And I breathe in, and I still, I try to just breathe in these eyes. And to you, we say, Heilig Tzadik, Yerchai Vekayam, Tehenish Masrat Sura Bitsura Chaim. And we should be bzeich to learn and drink from your Torah, the Ol Me'ad. The next tzaddik that we're going to be hearing about briefly, it's a very, very, very painful story. So I want you all to buckle up and look into the eyes of the Heiliger of Shlomo David Yeshua Weinberg of Slonim. Today, everyone knows of Slonim. Obviously, since the Nesiva Shalom came onto the scene, it's, it's who hasn't heard of Slonim? But where did Slonim originate from? So Reb Slum, everyone knows Slonim originated mainly from the two tzaddikim, Reb Meishe Kabriner and Reb Noach Lechavitcher. And they had a top Talmud, the Reb Avram of Slonim, the Yisod Aveda. He also wrote the Chesed Avram, the Be'er Avram. This is not the Birkas Avram, that's a later Reb Avram of Slonim. So this first Reb Avram of Slonim had a son, Reb Michal Aaron. And Reb Michal Aaron had a son, Reb Shmuel, who became Rebbe. Reb Michal Aaron did not become Rebbe. From Rebbe Avram Slonim, his grandson, Reb Shmuel, was the one that became a Rebbe. And then he had a son, Reb Avram, the Birkas Avram. Many of the are learning his tires now. And he had a son, Reb Shlomo David Yeshua. And I'm asking you all, as much as you can, to look into his eyes while I share with you a few things about this Reb Shlomo David Yeshua. Shlomo David Yeshua became a Rebbe at the age of 21. And he marries into the, the Morgenstern dynasty. There was cuts blood going on over there. And for two years, actually, he was sitting by the table of the tzaddik that we just saw, of the Alexandra, because he married into that family as well. And as you know, Slonim, he moved then to Baranovich, and he opens a yeshiva there, Taurus Chesed, while also taking care of the Slonim yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, the, the base of Ram. There were already Slonim or Chassidim living in Yushlaim then. And when the Germans, Yimach Shemam, came into Baranovich and they set up the ghetto, the Rebbe entered the ghetto and he kept his levush the whole time. And he was busy helping everyone in the ghetto, nonstop. Now the ghetto in Baranovich was completely destroyed in 1943. And the Rebbe was taken to a camp near Baranovich. Now, this is, this is startling, okay? This is, there's a few facts that we found out about the Rebbe's life when he was there. One is that the Rebbe, despite the, the crazy intense danger that it entailed, the Rebbe always put on talus and fill in in the camp. He didn't touch one piece of treif. On Pesach, he was able to figure out a way to not eat chometz, but also to not give away his food because he didn't want any yidla to, to eat uh, chometz on Pesach. All these different inyonim. But a story that happened to him in the camp 
it, it was is a brilliant story, and I want to read to you that on Purim, the Rebbe wanted to do a Rikud. He wanted to dance, but how was he going to do that on Purim? So there were also some non 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 Jewish uh, Asirim prisoners in that in the in one of the camps nearby, and their door was Pone was facing the door, meaning the door of their tzrif of their um, their their their. I don't even know how you say Tzrif in English. Their little tent, their hut, where they were shoved in, was facing the hut of the Yidin. So the Rebbe that you're looking at had a great idea. He said, you know, before night, we're going to invite our neighbors across from us to uh, do a little dance contest and to see who dances best. So they invited the Christian neighbors to say to this contest and right away they said, oh no, no, we can, we can for sure dance better. So the, the Rebbe said, okay, show us. And they danced. And then the Rebbe said, uh, okay, now it's our turn. And they started dancing like crazy. Kiv doing a dance contest. But really the Rebbe was Makayim the Mitzvah of Simcha and Purim. But a little bit later that year, in November 1943, the Rebbe was chosen first in the Selection. And on that day, the Rebbe turned to one of the Yidin with him and said to him, and listen to this, this is based on a Midrash in, in the Yalkut and Tehillim, but listen to what he said to one of his Chassidim, and look into his eyes while, while you hear the following words. He said that the Ribbon Shleilam colors his own garments with blood of Yidin who were killed al Kiddush Hashem. Is there anything more in the world I could ask for in this world? And calmly he walked to the first row with his head, with his head held up high. His eyes were gazing at Shemayim. And while he was staying to Hillen, 80 more Yidin were right behind him. And they gunned them all down right there and threw them all into a mass grave. And today, the whole world is learning the Torah of your anacles. The whole world is, is filling their, their Shabbos dishes with the Torah that came from your family. And your chai v'kayim l'netzach. Tehein ishmas chatzrura b'tzor achayim anitzchim l'ol me'ad. So I know we're we're jumping. We have we have some amazing amazing things to get to. The next tzaddik, I have to be very honest. This picture, since we found it, has been haunting me. This face is a face. My wife and I cannot stop looking at this. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a picture of this tzaddik. But there's something, obviously, there's something here in the eyes. On a personal level, this hit my family a little bit, um, a little bit, Baruch Hashem, in a good way, pretty close, close to home, very close to home. And you'll hear why in a second. But I just want you for one second to breathe in this Yidala, this holy tzaddik's eyes. And I'll tell you a little bit of who he is. So as you could see the name, it's a name that many of us have heard before, right? This is Reb Avram Yeshua Heschel of Mejibush. Who is he? So this is amazing. Just go, go with me, shlav by shlav. We're going to see where he comes from. Who else was Rebbe Avram Yeshua Heschel? His Elta Elta Zaini. The Apta Rebbe, Avram Yeshua Heschel of Apta. And his son was Rabbi Yitzchak Meir. He had a son. This is the son of the Abter Rebbe. Remember, the Abter Rebbe was not from Medjibush. He was from uh, Yasa in Romania. But he ended up in, 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 in Medjibush. So um, he has a son, Rabbi Yitzchak Meir. And then he has a son, Rabbi Meshulam Zusha. And he has a son, Reb Avram Yeshua Heschel, who's known as Heschel. This is not the Avram Yeshua Heschel that we're looking at right now. This Heschel has a son, 
Reb Yisrael Shalom Yosef. If you know the names of Chassidus, that name sounds pretty familiar. That's because he is a originator from his mother's side, right, from Bosch. And he is son, Rabbi Yisrael Shalom Yosef's son, is the an Avram Yeshua Heshel of Medjibush. And this tzaddik, these eyes, these passionate eyes, just breathe them in. His story is horrendous, but his life was glamorous. He becomes a Rebbe in 1912, at the age of 20, right after his Abba dies. And after his Abba dies, he's Musmach, he's crowned to be Rebbe by three high caliber tzaddikim, by uh, Rebbe Tzachak Bayaner, Rebbe Yisrael Chortkover, these are probably his great uncles, and Rebbe David Oskver. They say to him, you're, you're the Rebbe, you're next. And he's in Medjibush for 10 years. Now, it's interesting, as while we were learning about him, we noticed that the tzaddikim tried very hard not to, sp- they were always told and encouraged, don't go to Medjibush, don't set up shop in Medjibush. The Dengel Mach Nefraim and his brother, Abur Medjibush, they only lasted, to uh, I think, 12 years, each of them. Anyone that tried to set up shop there, you don't, you don't mess with the Baal Shem's territory. He also, after 10 years, he moves to a town where my Bubby is from. And when I was learning this this morning with my father, I got very emotional about this because there could be some family connection to the following story. He moved to the town called Tarnopol. Tarnopol, who else is from Tarnopol that we know of? The Minchas Chinuch. And he goes to Tarnopol, which is not too far. In fact, in all of our trips to the Ukraine, I always say that one year I'm just going to leave the, the, the group in the middle and just run to my Bobby's town. You know, it's only, what? You know, it's, it's like three hours drive, which is like nothing for Ukraine, as you know. Next time, Be'ez HaShem, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll get there. And um, he moves to Tarnopol. Now, in, 18, in April of 1943, there was this big aksia in Tarnopol, and many of the Yidin were arrested, including the Rebbe that you're looking at. And please keep your eyes on his eyes. Yemach Shemam, the Germans, they demanded, in order to release the Rebbe, they demanded 25 yid, dead Yidin to release the Rebbe from prison. And the Rebbe said, not a chance in the world that I'm coming out on these conditions. And the Rebbe was taken out to the town square with hundreds of other Yidin with him. His mother was with him. His brother was with him. He had an only daughter. Her name was Chanala. She was with him also. And he turned to the crowd of the Yidin and he said to them, Yishas Kubanai. Yishas Kubanai. This is a Gzera from Shemaim. And we are all shluchim to Mekadeh Shem Hashem Barabim. And they were all led together with their Rebbe, Rebbe Avram Yeshua Heshel. Look at this, look at this face. This is, this is the after Rebbe. This is Mamash the Ayav Yisrael right in front of you. I, I was telling the Chabra before, you see, it's so hard for me to finish this story because, because it's, it's, I can't finish the story yet because I, because I don't want to. None of us want to finish these stories. You know, Chavar, you, you know, you've heard me talk about this tzaddik many, many times. This is one of our greatest tzaddikim. And this is a cousin of the tzaddik we just looked at. This is Reb Moshe Heschel. This is Moshe Le Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. The famous story of Shlomo said, if you look at the face, it's the same face. Reb Moshele became a breast liver, but he comes from the home of Kapichnitz. This is all the same mishpacha. This, this is the face. I, I can't stop staring at it. It's the face of the Apter Rebbe. It must be. It's also the face maybe of Heiliger of Israel Rishner. I don't know. But we know that after the Rebbe told his chassidim, his chas kulbanai, get strong, we're about to fulfill a shlichus like never before. So they were all led to the neighboring town of Petrikov. 
and all of them were shot to death and thrown into a big mass grave at Kever Achim, which also, I guess, has to be one of our stops on our future trips. And we today, the end of Nisan, Tafshin Pei, are telling you that the Avram Yeshua Heschel, the great great grandson of the Apter Rebbe, of Rebbe Israel of Rizim, with you and your beautiful Panim still shining in the world. Your Chai the Kayam, and Be'ez Hashem, all the tires of your Zaydas, we hope to continue to infuse within our beings, Be'ez Hashem is Barach. And by the way, Chavr, anyone that wants, I'm more than happy afterwards to send out, to email all these pictures to, to, to whoever would like, just send me a message. So that was Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel of Medjabush. The next tzaddik you see in front of you is a tzaddik, the very, very heavy story. The tzaddik is Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Friedlander of Liska. The dynasty of Liska, what's Liska? And by the way, I apologize, this is the only picture we're able to find in I always say, like, focus on the focus on the face, and it's it's a little bit hard over here. But you could see the eyes. You could see those eyeglach. You could see it coming inside. Look at the screen. Look at those eyes. And um, this Reb Tzvi's Friedlander of Liska. So what's what's the dynasty of Liska? It's not not as known as as, as we know. Um, it starts by Reb Moshe Teitelbaum. Obviously, it starts it starts way back up there. It's 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 goes to Satmar Sigit. Uh, even the mayor from Schlaner. I'm not going to get too much into the details of the Shoshel because we still have we still have a way to go. But um, his Abba was Reb Chaim, and he was Nifter in 1904. Now his son then became Reb in 1904. Reb Tzvi Hersh Friedlander of Liska. It's important. Remember the name. Remember the punim. Remember the punim. And he's already pretty. Old, he's, pretty, he's already pretty much um, older by then. He's not a young rabbi. He is a huge Talmud Chacham. He's the Rosh Yeshiva in Liska. And Nazis come into Liska in March of 1944. He was already 70 years old by then. Not the oldest of the tzaddikim we're going to be learning about. And um, when he comes into when the Nazis come in, so his son, his son, his name was Reb Shlomo, he did whatever arrangements he possibly could to release his father from the ghetto in Liska, but to, to, to no avail. It, 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 didn't, it didn't work. Just like many of the tzaddikim, they wouldn't do it. They would not leave. They pushed couldn't leave. So from Liska, he was then transferred to another ghetto in a place called Oyel, where the Gemach Shemam and where the Germans... Just look, look, look at, look at his face while I tell you the following thing. The Germans grabbed this yidla and started pulling out his beard and chopped it off in front of all the Hasidim that were with him. This is a seventy-year-old rabbi being with people that he was probably mishamish already for forty years. Yeah, exactly forty years. Became a Rebbe in 1904. 40 years later, 1944. And they chop off his beard. And Hasidim that were there gave testimony that while they were chopping off this Rebbe's beard, he was bursting in tears like a, like a, like a three-year-old. Many of us here have three-year-old children with a tantrum, both, both going through a tantrum. The Rebbe was crying. He couldn't stop crying. It was so, so unbearable. And the Hasidim were freaked out by this sight. Beardless Reb Tzvi Hirsch, four weeks later, he was sent to Auschwitz. And now listen to what happens on the train to Auschwitz. One of the Hasidim, his name was Reb Baruch, he was a survivor, he gave edus, he gave testimony to the following story. Somehow, someone smuggled into, onto the cattle car a bottle of wine because it was Shabbos. They were going on Friday, I think, or maybe it was already Leil Shabbos, I don't know. But somehow they smuggled a bottle of wine onto the, onto the into cattle car. 
And the Rebbe had wine for, enough for Kiddush and for Havdalah, too. But after, during Kiddush, Shabbos day, the Rebbe turned to this Red Baruch and thanked him and told him, listen, the, the children here are so thirsty. Give them, give them all, finish the bottle, give them all wine. But Rebbe, there's not going to be enough for Avdallah. And he said, Baruch Hon, there's not going to be need for Kiddush for Avdallah. And before Shabbos came out, this tzaddik that we're looking at, the Tzvihish Friedlander, and his three children went up in the gas chambers in Auschwitz. May we be zoichet to be yonak by just looking at your face, at your panim. However, it's very hard to go from from um, rebbe to rebbe like this. It's 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 not so simple, I know. And in the morning, in between in between songs, in between. Uh, the Rebbe's that we were going through, I would, I would, I would sing. Um, but my, right now it's 1.15 in the morning and my kinderloch, Baruch Hashem, are sleeping. But that's just a lame excuse because what, what I would really love to do right now is to have my brother come on right now. Give us a, a, a nigun to breathe through right now. We just have to breathe through this nigun. And, uh, come right back with another one of the tzaddikim. So, Eitan Bechavad. You can hear me? All right. The last, the last five, ten minutes, I'm thinking, what nigan can I possibly sing after, after these, these, these stories, these, these things, but uh, this, is, this is just what came to mind. Thanks, bro. Thank you so much, Achim. That was, that was exactly it. Thank you so much. So we're going now to look at a face of someone that is startling as well. 
And it'll look really, really good. Look really, really, really good at this face. <laughs> Who is this tzaddik? Who is this tzaddik? Many of you have seen this face before, but let's learn about this tzaddik. Who you're looking at is the Sokol of Rebbe, Rabbi Yitzchak Zelig Morgenstern. Morgenstern? Who is this Rabbi Yitzchak Zelig Morgenstern? So when we know Morgenstern, we go to the Helege Kotzke Rebbe. We have the Kotzke Rebbe, Rabbi Nachman Mendel of Kotzk, his son. We pulled out his sefer before. His son is Rabbi David Kotzke. The Ahavas David. This is, this is an incredible sefer. I don't know how many of you have it. It's, it's wonderful. This is Rabbi David Kotzke, the son of Rabbi Mendel of Kotzk. And... He had a son, Reb Chaim Yisrael of Pilov. And Reb Chaim Yisrael of Pilov had a son that you're looking at. So who you're looking at, this is the great-grandson of the Kotzke Rebbe. If you ever wanted to know what the Kotzke Rebbe looked like, this may be a glimpse. This tzaddik, the pictures, the two pictures that we have found of the Sokol of Rebbe. Reb Yitzchak Zelig Morgenstern. What's his life like? Well, Rabbi Yitzhak Mazak Morgenstein, he gets married at the age of 16, which actually back then is probably um, pretty late, no? 16 years old, gets married. In the course of his not so long of a life, he has 11 children. And I want you to keep that, in, that fact in the back of your mind the whole time. He's married at 16 and he has 11 children. Now in nine, the year 1900, he becomes the Rav in Sokolov, <clears throat> and he was the Rav in Sokolov for 40 years, 40 years. So I guess he lived, he's a bit longer, his lifespan was a bit longer than I thought. 40 years he's Meshamish and Rabbanus in Sokolov. This is the Kotzke Rebbe's great-grandson. And during World War I, the Rebbe moves to Warsaw, like many of, of the Chatzairot, many of the Tzadikim who had to move it, in those times. And he reopens his yeshiva after the war and he made it even bigger. He was also a Rosh Yeshiva before the war. Now this tzaddik, Rabbi Yitzchak Zelig, he was privileged to receive directly, directly from his Zayder, Rabbi David Kotzke, the son of the Kotzke Rebbe. And one of the things that he received in that chinuch, in that home, was tremendous chibas arts. They were so big on Avas Eretz Yisrael, Avas Am Yisrael, he was a big supporter of Yidlach going to Eretz Yisrael and becoming chachlaim, becoming like agri- masters in agriculture and farmers, kamuvan though, very, very much al derech al taras you know, very harif ways, zekotzke at the end of the day, but very much Eretz Yisrael was on the agenda quite often. In fact, he himself travels to Eretz Yisrael, this tzaddik, the kotzke's great-grandson, 1924. And uh, he, he was biz, very busy while he was in Eretz, here in Eretz Israel. He met with Herbert Samuel. He also, I'm not referring to the hotel, I'm talking about the actual person, Herbert Samuel. And he also was busy with two camps, trying to make shalom between them, the camp of Rav Kook, and not Rav Kook himself, but his chevre, and the Rebbe of Chaim Zolmenfeld's chevre, trying to make shalom between them. And when he came back to Poland, so he stopped by in Warsaw, before going to Sokolov, and he stopped by one of his cousins who were there. And word got out that the Sokolov Rebbe, the Kotzker's great-grandson, came back from Eretz Yisrael, and they wanted to hear, what, he, what did he have to say? What can he say about Eretz Yisrael? They surrounded the house where the tzaddik was staying. And when he noticed that everyone was surrounding the house waiting to hear if he had anything to share, the tzaddik took his head out the window, and he screamed out, Yidin! He says, go to Eretz Yisrael. Seul Eretz Yisrael. Why? Ki toiva ha'aretz me'oid me'oid. That's what he screamed out to the Yidin there. Go, go. It's good. The land is good. Ay, 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 ay. What's, what happens with him? So before World War II began, he got very sick, this tzaddik, and he traveled to Advats, which was one of the first places to be bombed by the Germans. And um, three weeks later, after he gets there, the Germans invade Advax. And uh, 
the matzah was really, really, really bad. This is already Elul time. And something happens on that Yom Kippur. On that Yom Kippur, in the, right before he begins davening in the Elah, Rabbi Tzachzelik turns around to the crowd and says, they killed my boychik. They murdered my boychik. And he starts screaming, my son, my son, they murdered my son. Now, what actually happened? This just shows you what kind of a Ruch HaKredesh Yidla we're dealing with. In a town nearby, his son, he was the Rav of Vinegrad. I think his name was Reb Mendel. I don't remember exactly. I think his name was, Reb, it would make sense. And his name was Reb Mendel. And uh, the German stabbed his son to death right before Neila. And he knew it. No one told him a word. He knew it. Give out that he knew it. And the Rebbe continues to get very, very sick. And, and a few weeks later, Gimel Cheshvan, also the Yotzeh to the Rizhner, this tzaddik is buried at the age of 76. He's, he, he, sorry, he dies at the age of 76. And the Hasidim, this is like 19, 19, what did we say it was 1943, right? The Hasidim are, are I'm sorry, this is the end of, uh, end of 39. So this, this is already, things are already in, mamish crazy. But somehow the Hasidim with Me'otmet Mesiris Nefesh, and it wasn't simple at all. They schlepped him, they buried him next, into, in the Warsaw Ghetto, right next to the son of the Chidu She'erim, who happens to also be the Ava of the Svas Emes, the Ava Mordechai Alter. Again, they were all Mishpacha also, because Ger and the, the Ger Rebbe and the Kotzka were, were, were brother in laws. So we say to you also, Heilig Tzadik, as we look into your eyes, great grandson of the Kotzke Rebbe, Tzchisel Genaleinu, and this is his kever, we say to you, you are Chai V'Kayim, your Abba Zaidi and Alta Zaidi is Taira Chai V'Kayim, Tehenish Mascha Tzrula B'Tzor Chaim. So the next Tzadik that I want to talk about I'm going to try to do this a little bit more briefer than I did in the morning, because it's a sod. This tzaddik is an absolute sod. Just like everything about the chassidus of this tzaddik, it's all a sod. This is the Kamarna Rebbe. This is Rebar of Safran. Now, where did Kamarna come from? It's a whole story, and this is not a history sheer, uh, it's not a history shmuz, but just very fast, I'll try to explain it, that the Chayzer of Lublin had a student whose name was was Reb Sender. And Reb Sender had a son whose name was Reb Yitzchak Isaac. Reb Yitzchak Isaac had a son, his name was Reb Eliezer Tzvi. Reb Eliezer Tzvi had a son, Reb Yaakov Moshe. Reb, all from the from Safran, 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 they were called, Safran. And they had a son, he had a son, this Reb Yaakov Moshe had a son named Reb Sholem Safran. And he was married to Chava, Chava was the daughter of the Yanuka from Stalin, which, well, Karlin Stalin, which we'll get to in, in a bit. And they had a son, Reb Baruch Safran. Now, I just want to talk about this Reb Baruch, but he's directly in the chain of Kamarna. Kamarna is a whole sod. I remember, I, I don't know, how, what's it called? Hechal Abracha? Is that the Kamarna Siddur? I think it's that the Kamarna Siddur. I've had it for years. And, and every time I pick it up and I start reading one of the Pirushim there, I... I I wonder how many neshamas in the room right now are mamish laughing at me. The Kamarna is a, is, is a, one time with Judah Michelle on Purim, he bought me, he bought me a sacred. I think this is it. Is this it? Yeah. Kesem Ophir. Al Megillus Esther. Oh, Sodos. Sode Sodos. Kamarna. Mamish say this. Anywho. This Reb Baruch, he was a tremendous masmid. Now, try, if you can, to just focus on his face, on his ziv panim. The story is really, really out there. So this tzaddik, he was a big, big masmid, and after his father died, the Hasidim crowned him as Rebbe, and he be- immediately, immediately be- he began a yeshiva, he called it Binyan Shalem, named after his father, Reb Shalom, and he himself gave shir every single day in the yeshiva, and he had a lot of Hasidim in Hungary. And after his uncle, who was the Munkach Rebbe, but was, was Nifter, so many Hasidim of Munkach became Hasidim of Kamarna. 
Now, during the Second World War, the Hungarian Hasidim somehow were able to obtain uh, a, an, an entry from the Hungarian government themselves for the Rebbe, where they hoped that he would be saved, but the permit was only for him and not for his mother who was still alive, and he wouldn't leave her. He didn't want to leave her back in Galicia, so he stayed with her in Kamarna. And by then, things are getting worse every single day by the Yidin, and the Rebbe, at that time, he had a lot of gold and silver that he got in Yerusha and the family, and he decided to, to sell everything and to disperse the money amongst all the Nebuch Yidin that didn't have anything there. And one of the Hasidim went up to the Rebbe and said, Rebbe, uh, sorry, one of his family members went up to him and said, Rebbe, what, uh, uncle, whatever the relation was, why are you doing this? They were trying to prevent him from doing this, but his answer was simple. The Kamarna said, this Reb Baruch said, if the world is going to remain to exist after all this insanity, guess what? I'll buy new Kalim. And if it doesn't exist after this whole insanity, then why do I need any of this Bichla in the first place? So, on Erev Shabbos Rosh Chodesh Cheshvan, 1942, the Germans caught hundreds of Yidin. The brother of the Rebbe was, Reb Shlomo was one of them. And they took them out to the, to the, uh, to the Brezhnev forest, stripped them all naked, and shot them. So a little while later, in Kislev in 1942, right after his brother was killed, with a lot of the Hasidim from Kamarna, so the ghetto, the ghetto itself in Kamarna was, was uh, liquidated and the Rebbe was sent to Sambor. And he, one of the first victims of Sambor was actually the Rebbe's mother, Chava, his own wife, Shendo, and the two children that they had. Two boys, Sholem and Yaakov Moshe. Sholem was five years old. Yaakov Moshe was three years old. Now what's startling about this story is that this tzaddik, after everything we just described to you, his brother, his mother, his wife, and his two children, he's in the ghetto of Sambor, and he can, he's able to still give shir daily. He's able to lead tishes on Shabbos. He gave so much chizuk to the Yidin there. It was unbelievable. But the Rebbe could sense that, that time is near, and he actually summoned all the chassidim that were left in the ghetto one morning, and he said, guys, you got to run out of here. You got you, you got to flee. You got to leave Roch. And Baruch Hashem, many of them listened to him, and they were saved. And while they were running away, though, they begged the Rebbe, please come with us. But he said, obviously, as long as one Yidla is left in the ghetto, I'm staying with them. And as you could imagine, on the second day of Shavuos, the following year, 1943, the Germans, Yemach Shemam, they took Reb Baruch and they brought him to a grave, a fresh grave. It was a grave where two days before that, his cousin was just taken abruptly, shot dead in the forest. And was murdered right there. They brought Reb Baruch to this site. They opened the grave where they buried his cousin. They put this Reb Baruch right next to him. He looked up to Shemaim, and he was gone. And they threw him into the pit right next to his cousin. Somehow, Later that night, Hasidim that were still alive, they snuck out in the middle of the night somehow, and they went and they tried to machaber the area, and they covered it, they recovered it, tried to close it, but this is the story of Reb Baruch Kamarna. This is the Saf, this is the Reb Baruch, the Heiligit Sadik Masmid, Reb Baruch of Kamarna, Tehenish Moschat, Srura Bitzor Achaim, Le'ol Me'ad, and may you be a Melitz Yesher and all of us in Shemaim, Be'ez HaShem is Baruch. So the next Yidila, is a Yidla that many of us feel connected to. But I am, if I didn't ask you yet to look into a Yidla's eyes, I'm asking now. Please, please, please. 
because this story and this tzaddik touched my heart so deeply. We did not learn him this morning. This is for now. Um, many of you, like myself, my, for me, it's my mother's side, we come from Ger, Hasidus of Ger. I know, I, I, so many of the Chaberim here, I know a lot of you have a yichas to the Ger Rebbe's. So who is Reb Meishe Betzal Alter? So obviously we all know the first tzaddik in Ger was the Chidush Arim. Then his son was not Rebbe, Reb Avram Mordechai Alter, but his grandson, the Svas Emes, was. And the Svas Emes had six children. So just Stam as a side note, my mother, I shared this with the Chavra earlier, my mother, her maiden name is Warshaviak. This is how I found some mishpacha today. My mother's last maiden name is Warshaviak. Warshaviak is a direct line to one of the daughters of the Chidushe Harim. Now, all the Chidushe Harim's children died in his lifetime, as we know. <clears throat> Hashem Hirachen. He had many children. But anyway, the Svas Emes, he has six children. And as you know, the oldest son was the Imre Emes. But his second son is the picture that you're looking at right now. This is the second son of the Svas Emes, the brother of the Imre Emes, Reb Moshe Betzalel Alter. You gotta look at these eyes. You gotta look at this face. Something's going on here. Something tremendous. The eyes, especially in the first picture. Really, mamish frightening. You could, you, could, you could read the whole world through these eyes. So he's born in 1869. Remember, he's the second son of his five summers. And he himself was 36 when his Abba passed away, when his five summers died. And when his five summers died, so the other brothers, they went to other towns to become Rabbanim. They didn't want to stay. Obviously, the Imre Emes was crowned as the Mamashif. So they didn't want to bother in the Inger. So they went to different towns. But this, this Tzadik Yesod Oilam, Reb Moshe Betzal Alter, had no Indian going anywhere else. He stayed in Ger. He became a full-on chassid of his brother. Let me tell you about the Seder Hayom of this Yid. You know what you know, his day was like? I kind of talk, talk to you in learning. So in 2 a.m., he got up every single morning at 2 a.m. And he got up and he learned till Shachris. Then he ate for a few minutes. And he always carried a handkerchief on him. He put a handkerchief over his eyes. He slept for approximately eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes. Then he got up and he learned until the afternoon. And after lunch, which I'm sure was no smorgasbord, he then again took out the handkerchief, put it on his face for another five to 10 minutes. And then for that little nap. And then he learned again till midnight, waking up two hours later. This is how he was for 35 years in Ger, in the home of his brother in the yeshiva. And he didn't want any covered because of being mishpach. He just wanted to be close to his brother. They did give him two kibudim. He was the Baal Tokea in Ger, in Rosh Hashanah. I remember, I see my chavar, Danny Gibber. Remember when we went to Ger, it was closed. <laughs> and we were there with Rebbe. It was closed that day. But I can, you just imagine him in that building. This tzaddik was the Baal Tokea in that building. And they also gave him the kibbutz of sitting up front of the tish. He was front. He was in the, he was in front next to his brother. And uh, the Imre Emes actually wrote in his will that in his tzava he that he wanted this brother to be the mamshich. He wanted Reb Moshe Betzal to be the rebbe after him. And I want to read to you the lashon of the will that the Imre Emes left, which of course never came out to be, because if we're learning about this tzaddik here. He didn't last. But I want to read for you in Hebrew the will. We found the will of the Imre Emes. He said, The people need a man, they need a leader. I decided, I want to leave the Hanaga by my brother, Reb Moshe Betzal Shlita. He's connected to me in my heart, in my ruach, in my neshama. My brother, he will bring your hearts to our Father in heaven. 
וימשיך חסד וברכה והצלחה מן השמיים וטוב לכל הימים. And he'll bring down kindness and blessing and success from Shemaim for good for the rest of the day. So this is, this is how his brother, the Imre Emes, thought about him. So now let's get to... Oh, I hate this part of the story. This is like... It's almost like I'm wondering, like, why did, why did we even... Why can't we just stop here? But, but we, we have, we're going to continue. So as the Yemach Shemamim came into Poland, the Imre Emes moved to Warsaw, and his brother joined him, Rebbe Moshe And a bomb came down on the place they were staying, right there in Warsaw, and it immediately it killed his son. It killed Rebbe Moshe Betzalel's son, his name was Rebbe Shemayer, and also killed the Imre Emes as Gabai, Rebbe Label, his name was. This was two days after Yom Kippur. And in Warsaw, somehow Reb Moshe B'tzalo was able to go and bury his son. And it was an address of someone seeing him standing silently by the grave of his son and saying Kaddish. And they said the imagery was Bifchinas Bayidom Aaron. Now this, Reshim, this Reb Moshe B'tzalo entered the ghetto in Warsaw and he suffered tremendously. And the only consolation that he had was that he found out that his brother... The Imre Emes made it to Eretz Yisrael, which was such a dream for the family. And when he found out that his brother made it to Eretz Yisrael, it was the only nechama he had. The only nechama he had. <clears throat> now the Hasidim, the Ger Hasidim in the ghetto, excuse me, the Ger Hasidim in the ghetto, they managed to get Reb Moshe B'tzal a job in the factory, in the Schultz factory. This tzaddik we're looking at right now. These eyes were piercing with the eyes of the Piyasetz Nerebbe. They were together working in that factory, working, doing what the Avedos of Kredesh. Remember the famous testimony that was given over about what it was like to watch those tzaddikim work in the shoe factory. How one of them would say one Mishnah in Chagiga, the other would be Mashlim at Tosefta from somewhere else. And their Chiburim, their words of Torah, the conversations were Kshiras Ksarim, they were connecting crowns of Torah in their factory. This tzaddik, Reb Moshe B'tzalel Alter, was with the Piyasetzner in the factory. He was also with the other tzaddik we saw before, the Alexander Rebbe. Now listen to this. This is crazy. He would sit and learn. He was, like we say, he was a big masmid. But listen, this is amazing. He continues, he continues and continues to learn. One day, and he's in the factory. One day, in the ghetto, the Germans bursted through the factory, and they grabbed some yidden, including Reb Moshe B'tzalel, this story sounds very similar to how the Alexander Rebbe was also suddenly taken from the factory. It could be it was the same action, I don't know. And they sent him off to Treblinka. Now listen to this. This is amazing. And please, 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 keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on his eyes. He gets sent to Treblinka. Somehow, I, I, I wish I knew more about this story, and if someone knows more about this part of the story, please fill us in. Somehow, the Hasidim that were there managed to place him in a, in, a, in a coffin. He was still alive. They placed him in a coffin, and that coffin was sent back to Warsaw. And he comes back to the ghetto, which at that time... It only had about 40, 50,000 Yidin left. You have to understand the numbers, of, the numbers, you know, back then were, were massive, massive, massive. And um, it was only down to 40, 50,000. And by then, Chavra, the Ruach people were tzabrachen, like beyond words. And they knew this is the son of the Svas Emes. The Imre Emes is in Eretz Yisrael. They came to him for everything. They asked him all the shilas in the world. They asked him every type of shaila you could imagine. And like shilas about, why is the Ribbon Hashem doing this? Is it okay to try to kill a German if I know that a Yidla will suffer afterwards? Can I take my own life? This is the stuff he was dealing with. And in 1943, he was sent back again to Treblinka. And he was murdered there at the age of 74. We 
stand here today and we look into the eyes of this unbelievable tzaddik, Reb Moshe B'Tzadol Alter, and we're telling you, Hey Legazisa Rebbe, Hey Legazisa Rebbe, you are Chai V'Kayam, and together we will dance the great Mashiach Tzidkeinu, the Korv Mamish Mamish. I want to jump now to the last two Rebbes we're going to do today, because I realize it's already late, and we had a lot more to do, but that's okay. Ribbon Shleinam is Ruch Hashem, we still have a big chaver with us, but I want to keep it very focused. In order to understand the person you look at, if my chaver Shimon, who's managing all this, can you please post the lineage page that we prepared? That'll explain where we're holding right now. Because now it gets really, really interesting. Excuse my handwriting. No one handwrites anything anymore but I wanted to explain what we're looking at. So everyone knows, everyone knows that the Magid of Koshnitz, the Heilige Koshnitzer Magid, you ever see a picture of the Koshnitzer Magid? Do you want to see a picture of the Koshnitzer Magid? This is a drawing of the Koshnitzer Magid. The only drawing I believe. I saw one time another illustration which was very hard to decipher, this is one of the clearest. Again, Hevre, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like to receive these pictures. The Koznitzer Magid. What can we say about him? The Heilige Rabbi Yisrael Hochstein. Now he has, a, I don't want to talk about the, the Koznitzer as a whole. Rebbe has all these shirim on the Koznitzer. And uh, it's for now, but it's not for now. I want to tell you about his daughter. Okay? His daughter's name was Peril, Perla. The Magid of Koshnitz also has sons, which we'll see in a second, but right now the daughter is who I want to talk about, Pearl. Now, Pearl had a very hard time giving birth. She wasn't married to a big rabbi. Uh, I'm sure he was, a, he was a holy tzaddik, but he was not a rabbi that continued the line of anything over here. Now, he, she had a very hard time giving birth. So what did her Abba, the Koshnitz or Magid, do? He brought her to the Naim Ali Melech, who was still alive at the time. And the Naim Ali Melech tells the Koshnitz or Magid, that a tremendously great light is going to come from her. Now, after the Noam Elimelech died, she did give birth. And who does she give birth to? The famous Reb Chaim Meir Yechiel. He was known as the Saraf, right? the Eindop, the fiery angel. A tzaddik yesod oilam, a goyen oilam, a tzaddik yesod oilam, like, like, like no one's business. And the Koznitzer himself took very good care of this child. So the grandfather was taking very good care of this child, of this baby. And eventually, what's beautiful is that he set him up uh, with a shidduch. Who did, who did the Koznitzer Magid set his grandson up with? The granddaughter of the Nayam Aminelech. This Reb Chaim Meir Yechiel marries the granddaughter of the Nayam Aminelech. I don't have her name on, with me over here. But let's go back to the mother. This is, this is pretty wild stuff, okay? I'm, I'm warning everyone, this is really wild. And uh, I don't know, this is just what I learned, okay? This daughter acted like a Rebbe, Pearl. Pearl, she actually wore tzitzis underneath a long tzniyazdik, a silk lavush. She had a, a gartel that she wore out of, out of silk. She went to the mikveh every single morning before davening. She fasted Shani v'chamishi every week. And everyone knew that when she davened, and, and she wore talis while she davened, when she davened, she shook the heavens. It was a known thing. The Koshnitzer himself would send Chassidim to go to Perla to give, to give Pidya Nefesh. She was mamish from another world, this Perla. So her son, Reb Chaim Meir Yechiel, becomes a big Rebbe in the town of Magmanitza. Many of the Rebbes traveled to him. Now, go with me on the line that you see in front of you. He has three sons. Two of them became Rebbes. So on the, you see beneath him on the left is Reb Yaakov Yitzchak, became the Rebbe in the town of Blendov. And right beneath him is where we are, always feel most Shaykh to, is Reb Elimelech of Grudzisk. Who is Reb Elimelech of Grudzisk? 
The belly melech of Gwajisk is the father of the Piasetzner. That's how we see the Piasetzner is the great, great, great grandson of the Kozhnitzer Magid and of the Naim Ali Melech. But before he has the Esh Kodesh, he has another son. This son gets married young and dies young. He named his son after his father, Reb Chaim Meir Yechiel. By the way, this Reb Chaim Meir Yechiel, the Reb Elimelech's father, has another son, Rabbi Avram Yehuda of Meglanetza. But Reb Elimelech of Gujisk, remember, he has a son, Reb Chaim Meir Yechiel. He died at a young age, as a young father. And he had a son, Reb Yisrael. Okay? That is the picture that was on the screen before. So who are you looking at? Who is this Reb Yisrael of Grajisk? Reb Yisrael of Grajisk happens to be the nephew of the Piasetzner, right? His father was the Piasetzner's older, older brother. And go back to the eyes, Chavra. Go back to the eyes, because I want to tell you a little bit about this Reb Yisrael. This Rebbe Yisrael, he's born in 1874, and he was really brought up by, by, by the Rebbe Rebbe Reb Melech, because his father died when he was young, by the Rebbe Melech of Gorgisk, right? And his other grandfather, from his mother's side, was Rebbe Yitzchak of Bosch, the, from the Rishon dynasty. Good stock. So he, he was very, very talented, this tzaddik that you're looking at, Rebbe Yisrael Shapiro the Pia Setzner's nephew. He had an incredible voice. He composed many nigunim. And, um, you know, Grajisk, by the way, was a, was a big, big Hasidus. I, I actually, I learned recently that this tzaddik, I don't know how many of you recognize this tzaddik. I'm sure some of you do. If you could look right now at what I'm holding up. This is, this is, you know this is. This is Reb Levi Yitzchak Bender. Reb Levi Yitzchak Bender is from the town of Grajisk. So I recently read an article um, that was uh, an interview done with uh, El Rebbe Leal Sukkot, who said that when he found out that Reb Levi Yitzchak Bender was from the town of Grajisk, he asked the family if he had known the P.S. Etzner. It would make sense. They were alive the same time in Grajisk. But the, the word is, is that once Reb Levi Yitzchak found Reb Nachman, he completely blotted out and blocked out everything he knew about life beforehand. So he, there were no memories of anybody or anything. Back to the lecture at hand. This tzaddik for 20 years was the Rebbe in Grigis, but in World War I, like we saw by other tzaddikim, he moved to Warsaw. And he put out uh, a few svarim. One of them is called Emunas Yisrael, and one of them you see over here in the picture is the Binas Yisrael. This is Svarim put out by the Tzaddik of Yisrael Shapira. And he was a Rebbe for 48 years in Poland. As you see the second picture, this is him with the Imre Emes. The Imre Emes is on the left, and Rebbe Yisrael is on the right. Beautiful, beautiful Yidin. So beautiful. Look at this. Look how beautiful they are. Malchus. Pe'er v'chavod, mamish. Rebbe was talking about Pe'er. Look at this. Look at this Pe'er. Look at this glory. So this Rebbe Yisrael, like we said, he was a Rebbe for 48 years in Poland. But when the war, when World War II broke out, even though he, had a, he got a permit to leave, he stayed in the ghetto because he would not leave his Hasidim. And as the Germans began sending Gidlach to Treblinka, he didn't try to hide Bichlal. He was taken with his fellow Yidin, and he was put on the train and sent to Treblinka. And uh, one morning, <clears throat> the Germans were rounding up whoever they saw to go and kill them. So a chassid of his that was there saw the Rebbe and asked him, no, what does the Rebbe have to say now? So he said, Yirin have to mekabel the gzera with ahava. And then he continued and he said, listen, my brothers and my sisters, it's not on us to ponder about the ways of God. And if it's nigzar on us to be karbanas of chevlei Mashiach in this geula, listen to these words and look at his face while I tell you these words. Ashreinu, that we merited this, we must be happy 
that our ashes will purify Am Yisrael for the redemption. Don't cry while you're walking to the gas chamber. Be besimcha and sing animamin. <clears throat> Be like Rebbe Akiva. Thousands of Yidin did as he said. And they were murdered while they were singing animamin. This is Elul 1942. Shapira. What a schus it is to look at your face. What a schus it is to look at your face. In the name of all of us here, all the tzaddikim breit of Beit Gurjisk, that we've been privileged to be yoinik so much from, we take upon ourselves to reconnect ourselves, recommit ourselves to the Torah coming out of the base medrash of the Rebbe Rebbe Melech of Gujisk, his sons, his grandsons, the whole Hever, the whole island there. Ten Ishmas Chatzrura Bitzrur Achaim Anitzchim Le'ol Me'ad. So I'm just going to end right now, Hever, with the last Rebbe, because it's the same Ishbacha. This tzaddik that you see in front of you, not a simple Yidla at all. Reb Aram Yechiel Hopstein of Koshnitz. And he is a direct descendant of the Koshnitzer Magid, Ben Achar Ben Achar Ben Achar Ben Achar Ben Achar Ben, six generations. And he was a Rebbe for 20 years. And when the Germans invaded Poland, he moved like many of the others to Advatsk, to War- from, from Advatsk to Warsaw. And this tzaddik in the initial stages of the war, he worked very hard to get Whatever Yidlach needed, food, other supplies, it didn't matter what it was. You know, he had a lot of rich Hasidim, Koshnitzes, and they gave the Rebbe whatever he needed in order to help people. And <clears throat> there are a few versions as to how he was Nifter, which is really the only thing I wanted to share, because it's already very late, and we've covered a lot. We haven't even cut the truth, Yechever, Be'emet. We, we, we have to do many more of these, because we have probably another 80 to 90 tzaddikim that we know of now to share about. So <clears throat> one of the versions of his ptira is that it was Erev Yom Kippur 1942. And he's sitting in front of his Gemara when suddenly he looked up and he said, I push it, don't want to live anymore. And fell over and died. And according to that version, the Hasidim buried him right then, that, there and then at night, a proper burial. The other version is similar to the first one, that he died a natural death in the ghetto, in the Warsaw ghetto. Another version, and this gets, this gets a little bit gruesome, Mechila, was that the Germans knew that he was a Baal Menagen, he was a fiddler. They knew that he knew how to play Gewalt, so they made him play for them, like they did many, quite often, many times. And the tzaddik said, instead of playing for them, he took his kinor, he took his fiddle, and he crushed it, he slammed it, and he broke it in front of the Germans. And when they did that, they decided, ah, yeah, then baya. They tied him, they dragged him, they, they tied him to a pole on a car, or on a wagon or something, and schlepped him through the whole city. Now, the last version is, is probably the most accurate based on how things mapped out, is that the Rebbe was actually sent by his Hasidim to the town of Zelichov. Now, we know Zelichov for many reasons, and the main one is because that's the town where the Hele Gedusha Slavi was rough before he was in Berdichev. And somehow, for, for whatever the reasons are, the cruelty of the Germans, it didn't reach Zelichov as bad as it did other places. But on Erev Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe got typhus, and Chassidim started davening their brains out, and the Rebbe's situation got worse. He kept on going in and out of consciousness, and the Rebbe died. And the Chassidim there in Zelachov started to decide where should he be buried. Some said, no, let's bring him back to Koznitz, where his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, till his, till his Elta Elta Zeta, the Koznitz Magid is buried, 
But some of the Balabatim and Zelachov said, no, 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 he has to stay here. It's too dangerous. We got to keep him here. So right there on the spot, they set up a base din of three tzaddikim, who paskin, don't take him out of the city, bury him right there in Zelachov, as you see his kever in front of you right now, and that's where, he, where he's buried. No matter how the, the story goes, we ended off tonight looking at two ends of a line coming from the Magid of Koshnitz. One through the son, Reb Eliakim Maisha, who's the great-great-grandfather of the tzaddik you're looking at, and the other was through Perla, the daughter. Koshnitz, the whole world of the Magid, I'm so excited, I have a new Chavrusa this week, we're starting to learn Avedas Yisrael. Israel. The Magid of Koshnitz, Bichlal, his story, how he came to be in the world as a bracha, like we know the famous bracha the Baal Shem Tov gave his parents. It's a whole Maisa, it's a whole amazing, miraculous story. If you look at the picture in front of you, and you've seen it before, you know that the tzaddik you're looking at is the father of the Esh Kaidish. This is Rebbe Limelech of Gurdjitsk. You know, however, we have the schus of being Talmidim of Rebbe. I had the schus to hear about the Piyasets and Rebbe first time from Rebbe Shlomo when I was a teenager, and I heard him talking about him. Like many of us, these giants, these tzaddikim that we're learning from, these lives that we briefly, briefly went into for a few moments, These giants, as we said about each one of them at their Chai Vekayim, are demanding of us lo lehit pasher, no compromising. No compromising on what the Rebbe said, etzem gilui haneshama. The Rebbe was so big on making sure, the PSS and Rebbe, on making sure that you and I do whatever we can to find out who we really are, to find out who our neshamas are. So, I want to leave us all with a tefillah, with a nigun and a tefillah. I'm going to sing something very softly. A nigun and a tefillah, but in the schus of these tzaddikim, who they figured out who they were, we should figure out who we are. And we should fall in love with who we figure out, what we figure out, what we find out. At this point, I also want to thank my dear, dear, dear friend, Shimon Aaron Detweiler, the man behind the scenes for running this whole evening and all the Zooms we've been doing. I also want to thank my dear chaver and brother-in-law, Yehuda Hanekman, who worked so hard on putting together today. I want to thank Ushi for helping us with putting this together last second. Of course, I want to thank our Rebbe, our dear Rebbe, who we miss here so much. I'm sure you miss him too and you're around the corner. Me, Ani, Uma, I 
Thank you. Thanks for being partners. Thank you for being Shtafim Laderech. Thank you so much for being with us. Laila Tov. Besorot Tovot, Yeshua and Chomot. All witness the coming. Mashiach Tzitkeinu, Bekar of Mamish Kvar Achshav. Behavarava, everyone.